Hey, what's going on, everyone? How you guys doing? Matt Jarbo here, Hollywood After Dark Radio Show, Podcast, whatever you want to call it, movie news extravaganza is what's going to be happening here on the channel. It's a Thanksgiving Day miracle, folks, to actually talk about movie news here and to just start breaking it down and to have a good time with it and not have it be uh, everything I post on the channel. But but for right now, the Hollywood After Dark podcast is going to be coming out probably around 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. At least that point, it's considered after dark. So if I start swearing a little bit too much, it's not the end of the world. And let's hope one day, one day, you guys might like it enough to help me get to the point of being able to do it live at 8 p.m. nightly and then also take in your guys' calls because that's going to be the ultimate goal. But for right now, we're just going to do the podcast like this. And then on the weekends, probably around maybe Saturday night, a little bit later, because I have to be honest, I have to work Saturday night. I'll do a live call-in show and we can talk about what's going on, what's on your mind, the movies you like, and things like that. So I think that's going to be where we are right now. But before we dive in, let me just quickly give a shout out to the channel members, Gino, Master of None, Garguts Entertainment, The Gaming Godfather, Vince Bachelor, Awesome Cat, Gerald Johnson, my own father. So take that for what you will, nepotism. <laughs> and lovely day today. And if you want to add your name to this list, uh, you can always do so by becoming a channel member. Uh, link in the video description. That is my shilling. So why don't we why don't we dive into uh, today's stories? There's a lot to talk about, and even this poorly crafted thumbnail doesn't get to everything. But first, let's just dive right the hell on in. So Godzilla versus Kong apparently is going to be heading to streaming. This is uh, not uh, shocking, to be honest with you. This is not uh, what I would call too crazy. I think it's one of those things at this point in time where we're kind of like, yeah, well. I mean, movies are going that way. Look at Wonder Woman 84. And uh, and a lot of people are upset about that. So Godzilla versus Kong. Let's see what it says here. According to Collider, in the wake of giant blockbusters like Mulan and Wonder Woman 84 debuting on streaming instead of waiting for mass theatrical exhibition to be safe again, Godzilla versus Kong might be embarking on the similar path. Per The Hollywood Reporter, it is very likely that the big budget MonsterVerse crossover extravaganza will make its bow on a streaming service. And two of the biggest ones have the money to mess around and find out who wins. So here's the thing. Is this a good idea? The answer to that is no. I mean, it's not to me. I'll be honest with you guys. Not to me. But to Warner Brothers, especially Legendary, who was the ones who put the money up for this thing. Warner Brothers obviously took part of the financing and they're going to be handling the distribution. There's money to be earned here. But where is it going to go? Is it going to go to HBO Max or is it going to go to Peacock? Peacock is owned by Universal. Universal owns the rights to King Kong. But Warner's is distributing this, so they might be able to work out that deal to put it on HBO Max. And right now, that's probably for the best. Now, look, here, uh, this is where it gets to be pretty bad. Okay, so look at, you have to go back and look at the other Godzilla movies. So Godzilla came out 2014, May 2014, did okay. Godzilla King of the Monsters came out in 2019. Uh, that movie was awesome. That movie was fantastic. I called it pure sex. It's amazing. I love it. But the problem, though, is it debuted Memorial Day weekend. In a traditionally dead, you know, not that good of a time. And so as a result of that, as a result of that movie failing in the way that it did, uh, they put a lot of pressure on Godzilla versus Kong in order to make it uh, probably, you know, as, as profitable as it could be. And, you know, they've they've clearly been supportive of the film. But unfortunately, right now, it, its best bet is probably going to be streaming. And then they put it out in theaters when they can. But the, man, as a fan, what sucks the most about this is not being able to go see an IMAX, which is where something like this, the extravaganza, the bombastic nature of this film is quite frankly, what I, what I just, I, it's IMAX, man. You have to see this movie in theaters. Godzilla King of the Monsters is a good movie. And it's made even better by seeing it in the largest format possible. And I know people are going to make the argument, but I've got a 48-inch TV at home. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, 
Sure. Sure, man. Yeah. But I mean, some of these things you just want to see right in front of you. You know, I mean, look, I'm not going to let me let me get a little bit sexual here for a second. Would you rather look at a pair of boobs on a monitor or would you rather, you know, them be in your face? I'm just saying it's not necessarily the same comparison. But you know what I mean? Like you could look at your computer or your phone or your TV and look at a pair of boobs and go, yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I appreciate it for what it is. But if you have them in front of you, you really appreciate it for the, for the clearer detail, <laughs> right? And so that's a big part of it. That's a that's a big part of it. I, I don't know. I think uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, Warner Brothers did comment here and say we plan to release Godzilla v Kong theatrically next year as scheduled. But again, it all boils down to how well Wonder Woman eighty four does theatrically worldwide. Tenant pulled in like 350 million or somewhere 300 million worldwide. But as COVID spikes, more theaters internationally are shutting down. And some of these territories simply just aren't getting the movie. So that's something they're going to have to consider. However, look, I, if, if it came to HBO max, I would watch it. Okay. If it came to HBO max, I would totally watch it. So there's that. All right. So let's talk about this one here. Disney's predator reboot, taking the alien hunter to the past. Apparently a plot leak. For 10 Cloverfield Lane, Dan Trachtenberg's Predator movie has been revealed. Uh, This is what uh, it's saying here. Predator 5 will be set in the past, finally, where it will focus around Native Americans before the territories were taken over uh, by American settlers, featuring a First Nations cast. Now, this is interesting to me. Uh, This is very interesting to me. Now, this is a rumor. It's a rumored plot, but it's something that popped up the other day when they had talked about this, when the news first broke. So, I mean, look, if you want my honest opinion, uh, they're going to tie it. If this is true, what are they going to tie it into? All right. Like, you know, I'm I'm assuming it's going to probably end up being like there's going to be Americans, not Americans, European settlers. Okay. So that they were back then. Uh, and the, uh, the native Americans are, are gonna, you know, there's going to have to be a conflict between the two. I, I think it, it, it's probably not going to be like 10,000 BC or something like that. But look, this is a perfect opportunity to bring up Roanoke Island and have, you know, a predator go to Roanoke Island and like more or less like take it the hell out, you know? Um, although there were a lot of women and children that were reportedly there and the predator doesn't do that. Maybe it's a rogue predator. You know, he doesn't care. So I don't know. I'm just saying a Roanoke thing would be pretty dope. All right. But uh, the storyline, it, it doesn't, it, it's kind of cool. You know, it's kind of cool. I kind of feel like a little bit uh, Pathfinder. That Carl Urban Moon Blood Good movie from like, oh, seven, I think. That's one that I kind of get the vibe out of with this one. Um, even though that was like, you know, Carl Urban versus Clancy Brown as Vikings. Not the same thing 100%, but you kind of get the gist of it and mix that with maybe 2010's Predators could be interesting. I'm not against it by any stretch of the imagination. I'm looking forward to seeing what Dan Trachtenberg comes up with because I like the guy as uh, as a director and I want to see uh, him, his career actually move forward because so much of it nowadays, I feel like has just been so, so just shut down. But anyway, uh, Predator 5 storyline, I want to hear what you guys have to say about this because quite frankly... It's interesting. All right. So here's a, this story that's been popping up the, yesterday. Alfred Molina returning as Doc Ock in Spider-Man 3. Sony and Marvel Studios are gearing up to make some huge changes to the comic book movie genre with Spider-Man 3. Of course, what we've been hearing about with this is them diving into the multiverse. Uh, what was it? Uh, Scott Derrickson was talking about uh, Duncan Jones, David Bowie's kid, who's also a director. Uh, they were talking about Spider-Man on Twitter and Scott Derrickson was all like every iteration of Spider-Man is part of the MCU. Now that has fueled a lot of speculation and with, with Sam Raimi coming in to direct doc, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Strange in the multiverse of madness. What are we going to see? The multiverse is already teased in Spider-Man far from home. So are we going to get Alfred Molina as Doc Ock and Spider-Man? I mean, I'm actually okay with this and I'm really kind of against 
the multiverse, but I really like Molina as Doc Ock. All right, so this is what it's saying here. Alfred Molina is reportedly reprising his role uh, as Doc Ock in Spider-Man 3. The highly anticipated sequel is currently filming in, Af in Atlanta after a few setbacks due to public health crisis. It's also been confirmed that Jamie Foxx is joining with Tom Holland as Electro, though the actor mysteriously deleted a social media post confirming the news. Oh, I didn't know about that. That's new. I didn't know that Fox got rid of that. Uh, now, Fox originally played the villain in Amazing Spider-Man 2 with Andrew Garfield as the hero, while Molina originally played in Spider-Man 2 with Tobey Maguire. So according to sources that are close to Disney and Sony, Molina is already on the Spider-Man 3 set. This is coming in from Geeks Worldwide, who have an excellent track record, broke the news and state that Molina has started on some stunt choreography and has started filming his scenes in the past couple weeks. As for story details, those are being kept under wraps. It should also be noted that this casting news has not been officially confirmed by Marvel Studios or Sony. Yeah, well, no shit. Right. And I look, I just I love that whole argument that comes up in these whole situations. Well, you know, it hasn't been confirmed. <laughs> yeah, because uh, they're not going to confirm anything. Are you kidding me? This is like a this is a highly anticipated thing to be kept under wraps. And you're like, yeah, they're going, oh, why do they, why do they go out there? Ah, whatever, man. You can't, you can't sit there and like, you know, get, get worked up over that. That's just a line they put in there. Well, no one's confirmed it yet. Well, we haven't got a lot confirmed. So there we go on that one. Anyway, let's <laughs> look. Okay. Okay. So uh, Molina coming back. I'm down for it. Jamie Foxx coming back. I'm down for it. I I, I have faith in Kevin Feige. Uh, I want to see how they handle this whole multiverse situation. Uh, and I do think that they're doing it in direct response to DC. I do. I think they're doing it in direct response to, to DC. They know they're doing it in direct response to DC. Um, but the thing is, they're better. Like, in regards to the whole aspect of the MCU versus the DCEU, look, Marvel is better at telling a story. It's yeah, it's homogenized. It's 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 very linear. All right, but like it's like watching a television show, and that's what I appreciate about it. DC's not so much there yet, although the storytelling in Man of Steel, BBS, and hopefully Justice League are going to be great, and that's what I'm looking forward to. But uh, you know, I, I am kind of curious to see what they do with it. So we we'll have to wait and see on this one. But uh, look, bring back James Franco as. <laughs> That's Harry Osborn, you know, bring back Willem Dafoe as Norman Osborn. I mean, how much play is he going to get as Volko and Aquaman too? I don't know yet, man, but bring them back. Bring them all back. Give me Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane. Finally, give me Shailene Woodley as Mary Jane because they shot her scenes in Amazing Spider-Man 2. They did. They shot her scenes in Amazing Spider-Man 2 and then they cut her out. The only thing that they kept in from any of that kind of world expanding stuff was, uh, what was it? Felicity Jones. Uh, was uh, Felicia, Harry Osborn, Dane DeHaan's assistant, you know? And it's like, oh, you got Jen Erso, and she's playing, you know, Felicia. And I'm all like, who who else is who else is Felicia in, in Spider-Man? There's no other character. You don't, you don't drop the name Felicia randomly. And of course, it, she was Black Cat. But they cut all that stuff out, and they killed it. So maybe we'll get her back. Uh, maybe we'll get a good Black Cat story. I don't know. Either way, I'm, I'm hype. <laughs> like, I'll admit, I just love Spider-Man. All right. Uh, so here's what we know now. This is a big one. This has been breaking yesterday. Since this is a reboot of the podcast, I didn't get to it then. But anyway, uh, James Bond star Mads Mikkelsen has uh, been cast to replace Johnny Depp in Fantastic Beasts. This has uh, been talked about for a while. Now apparently we're getting confirmation Saying here that Warner Brothers Pictures announced on Wednesday that the 55-year-old star, known for his role in James Bond's Casino Royale, Hannibal, and Rogue One, a Star Wars story, has been cast as the dark wizard Gellert Grindelwald. It's currently being uh, shot outside of London with a release date of July 15th, 2022. And of course, this comes just weeks after Warner's confirmed that Johnny Depp had departed the role as the villain in the Harry Potter series. And look, my thoughts on this are abundantly known fuck warner brothers for ditch and johnny flat out i'm just gonna say it that's a bad move it's a poor move it's poor judgment that being said now that we are in this reality mads mickelson is a dope ass actor 
And I think he could, he could bring a lot of terror to the role of Grindelwald. So that's one of those things where I'm kind of, um, it's okay. I'm okay with the casting because I have no control over it. But, you know, I mean, still F Warner Brothers for Ditch and Johnny. And now we're hearing reports, you know, that like a Mara solo film. I don't know. I've been hearing about, was it Daniel Rickman who said that the other day? I, his track record is shit. So who knows? <laughs> who, know, who, know, who knows at this point what's going to go on? I, ah. Look, man, Johnny Depp doing his thing is something that I, uh, I, I want to, I just, I feel bad. Uh, I, I, I'm going to see the movie cause I have to, but I'm, I'm just not excited for it. And maybe, maybe you guys are thinking different than me, but that's something I just want to know. All right. Uh, this is an interesting story that's on the thumbnail, but you may not know what it is. Uh, phasing in love or phase in love is a uh, suing universal over a movie that came out in 2009 couples retreat and he's suing it over the movie poster which shows him actually having been uh removed from the poster internationally we see here on the left you've got the international poster which has um you know it's got different images of of both of all the couples except for uh phase in love and uh was it Callie Hawk and then the U.S. poster shows him in there. And, uh, you know, they're just, he's, he's upset. He's suing. In fact, he, he talked to um, TMZ about this. And I want to play this clip so you guys get an idea of where he's coming from and uh, how pissed off he is. I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, I, my hands were tied. And I remember my wife, uh, at, the t- at the time I was married, my wife looked at me like, what are you going to do? I'm like, well, what can I do? I mean, you know. And um, she said, well, you know, Callie, Callie Hawk was very smart, very brilliant. Your co-star, right. Yeah, she, she doesn't deserve this. I don't deserve it. They planned on doing it. So it wasn't an accident. It wasn't like, hey, um, oh, we ran out of black ink. Why do you think they removed your image? I'm going to be honest with you. It's, it's white arrogance in Hollywood. To, to say that we're going to put you in the film and we're going to promote it, but I don't think anybody knows you overseas. Okay, say no one does know me overseas. Well, how are they gonna get to know me? Why cast me in your film that you know that's going overseas? It doesn't make sense. It's not even fair. It'd be different if they said, you know what? Maybe Faison's uh, look is not what we want and they kept Callie on. But how do you explain taking the only two black people that's in your movie, off the poster. Did they explain why they erased it? Did they ever give you any explanation for this? No, they, they're, they're, that's where the arrogance comes in. They're, we didn't know. They kind of tried to pass the buck. How do, you, how do you eliminate the two black people and say we didn't <laughs> know? They, somebody overtly took you out. So why did they take you out? I literally heard, that's where I got that joke from. Is maybe they ran out of dark ink. <laughs> I was like, what? It's an arrogant racist that thing. It's an underlying tone that has been there. Like I said, I, and I got upset when uh, John Boyega, when I saw the uh, for Star Wars, the um, trailer, and I was so happy. I was so happy to see him in that movie because I'm a big fan of Star Wars. And um, and they took him off the poster. I was I was like, this must. This is a direct because I didn't step up at the time and, and put my foot in somebody's ass. This is what happens when you don't step up at the time uh, and, and, and do what you're supposed to. Now, you know, he makes a really good point. Uh, internationally, uh, people of color have been removed from posters. And you might ask yourself, why? Why does this happen? Well, it's not, the answer is not good. The answer is not good. There's no good answer for this. The answer is actually racism. It is. It's racism. Uh, there's a lot of racism in other countries. And these companies, they promote these movies there. Because their job is to get people to go and see the movie. And their job is to put butts in seats. And their job is to make a lot of money. But there's racism. And that is a problem. And it happens in China. Uh, I forget which country it was. That's, it might have been Palestine or something. When, uh, when Wonder Woman came out back in 2017, they banned the movie in the country 
because Gal Gadot is Israeli. You know, and like no one freaked out, sued Palestine over it, you know, but it exists. This is the reality of the world we exist in. And of course, uh, when talking about it here, uh, you know, he brought up John Boyega and Star Wars and I actually found uh, that particular poster here. Uh, you can see on the left is the, uh, you know, U.S. version showing John Boyega, showing Oscar Isaac, right? Uh, everyone there. Now, if you go over to the international one, they've shrunk down John Boyega to underneath Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher, making him very tiny. And Poe Dameron is completely removed from the equation. So, you know, where where is justice for Poe? Uh, but it's true. They've done this. They do this multiple times in Hollywood. This doesn't, this isn't anything new. This isn't anything that isn't common. It's not right under any circumstances. And I think uh, Faison has absolutely, uh, you know, a solid argument to make here. And it does require these companies to kind of look at how they, they do business overseas. And then, and then, you know, maybe try to work within changing cultural norms, but see, some people might argue, but Matt, you can't argue, you can't push back on cultural norms in another country. We don't live there. We have no say their rules, their game. We simply play it. I disagree with that to an extent. I think you can always have a, an inclusive conversation. I, I think that's, that's something that can be done. Unfortunately, though, so many people out there, they don't want that. They never want to have that hard conversation. And that's what Faison's doing. But I don't think he's got a shot, to be honest with you, because uh, I don't know, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a civil thing. And, you, you know, Universal will probably settle for amount of money and they'll come out and they'll make a statement about how racism is bad and how you shouldn't do it. Uh, and that they'll do better in the future. Because at this point, that's mostly what you're going to get out of them right now. But he's got a very fair argument to make. And it's one that a lot of people aren't aware of because we, in this country at least, we don't pay the fuck attention to like anything else that's going on out there. We don't care. Right? We don't. Let's be honest. Let's be honest with ourselves. We don't care what happens in other countries unless it directly impacts us. This isn't going to directly impact anyone here in the country because for one, Couples Retreat came out, I don't know, 11 years ago. It was a fun movie. And and no one, you know, it's, it's like, I, I wish him luck, man, but I'm he, he's just going to like probably just get sidelined like any other rational conversation in this one. But we'll have to wait and see. Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised with what happens. But all right, let's jump into the last story of the day. Uh, Joss Whedon has now stepped down from his HBO series, The Nevers. And this was one that happened a couple days ago. I was I was legitimately surprised when I heard about this. This is what it says. Uh, two years ago, HBO lined up Joss Whedon to create and executive produce The Nevers. It's a sci-fi fantasy drama about a group of women who develop superhuman abilities in Victorian England. However, it's now being reported that he has stepped down from the series and he did confirm the news. So this, I mean, look, the thing is the show, The Nevers, it sounds very much in line with something Joss Whedon would make. And then that would be canceled after one season at Fox, but it's HBO. So we'll see here. They don't, I don't, I think with the money they're putting in, they don't want to have it be canceled after one season. Uh, now he says this uh, year of unprecedented challenges has impacted my life and perspective in ways I could never have imagined. And while developing and producing The Nevers has been a joyful experience, I realize that the level of commitment required moving forward, combined with the physical challenges of making such a huge show during a global pandemic, is more than I can handle without the work being able to suffer. I am genuinely exhausted and am stepping back to marshal my energy towards my own life, which is also at the brink of exciting change. I am deeply proud of the work we have done. I am grateful to my extraordinary cast and collaborators and to HBO for the opportunity to shape yet another strange world. The Nevers is a true labor of love, but after two plus years of labor, love is about all I have to offer. It will never fade. So rumor and speculation abound on this one, right? I mean, there is, you're not going to stop the rumor train on this. The rumor mural is going full stop. So people have been asking, 
and speculating and i think with good reason is this because he's just tired and it's a global pandemic and i mean that's a valid those are valid excuses those are very valid excuses so then the question becomes if he is absolutely just at the end of his rope with all this stuff is that him is that the reason why he's leaving or is it because of the whole ray fisher accusation and how walter hamada uh, wanted to throw him and John Berg under the bus to save Jeff Johns. How it does appear like Warner Brothers itself, Warner Media itself has wanted to toss Joss Whedon under the bus. I mean, I mean, like Whedon comes across like a team player. So I get maybe not wanting to do that. But at the same time, it's that whole notion of like, well, maybe, maybe you shouldn't, have, you know, maybe, maybe you shouldn't have done it. All right, like maybe maybe you shouldn't be here right now while we have this situation going on. That's what I'm thinking is happening. You know, I'm thinking that it was one of those like he's like, look, I'm tired. And they're like, well, why don't you quit? And I'll be like, OK, you know, like we'll just we'll just make it a thing. And they've confirmed that they have that they have stopped collaborate, that they've broken off their collaboration with him. They've confirmed that at this point. So it's one of those issues where you're like, all right, we'll have to wait and see where it goes. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But uh uh, look, man, I've heard a lot of things about Joss Whedon over the years. Uh, a couple pretty significant ones. And a lot of people have as well. A lot of people have uh, criticized him and and how he does things for many years. And it feels like this is one of those situations where he can't outrun Ray Fisher. And so, you know, they found a way to mutually exit the project. Uh, usually when there's some kind of situation like this, what we hear in the press is not 100% accurate. Oh, we're in a global pandemic. I'm tired. There's something else in my life that's going to be happening. That's going to be awesome. You know, like what, what is that right there? That sounds like cope to me. This sounds like a whole heap of copium. Oh no. What was it? He says like, uh, uh, you know, to, to marshal my energy towards my own life, which is on the brink of exciting change that you're out of a job joss is that what's going on here i don't know uh, i feel at this point joss whedon should just stick to doing independent stuff and uh, give us a dr horrible too it's been 12 years you son of a bitch where's my sequel okay i will back off joss whedon bashing if he gave me a dr horrible too yeah that might make me a horrible person that might make me a raging hypocrite in your eyes i don't care I want more Dr. Horrible and that I'm going to stand by that. So there we go on that one. As, as, as always, I want to hear what you guys have to say about this because <laughs> that's some crazy news. So, all right, that comes to the end of the very first episode, the reboot of Hollywood after dark. This was fun. I feel good. This for me is cathartic because I, I get to just put together a bunch of stuff, talk about it. And then my hope, my goal, my aim is that you guys like it. And that you guys get in on this radio experience with me because that's more of where my passions lie, to be honest with you. Uh, having like highly edited, curated content is not that. I like to just put on my headphones, get in front of a microphone and just talk. That's where I feel the best. Um, so I always look forward to your guys' thoughts, your guys' opinions. Uh, and uh, be sure to uh, check out the Facebook group, which is a great way to stay in contact and, uh, and submit stories for me to talk about over there. Anyway, I will chit chat with you all later. Please remember to like the video if you made it this far uh, and have yourself a good one, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving and peace the fuck out.